Welcome to Hindu Analysis, July 14, 2018. So today we are going to discuss all these articles. So the first article is DNA profiles won't be kept permanently. So what the news is, India's proposed DNA data bank. So India is actually proposing a DNA profiling bill. So in that bill actually they, they are aiming at installing or establishing DNA data banks to collect the samples from the humans in order to investigation into the crimes as well as to find the missing persons using their DNA samples. So what the issue is it is affecting actually the privacy of the individual if at all the dna samples of the individual is getting collected by these dna banks but the reason in the recent news the department of biotechnology secretary said that it will not permanently store the details of the peoples or the details of the dna details of the people rather it will remove those dna details if at all it is subjected to the judicial order which means it first collect the dna samples from the people and it is using or it is making use of those DNA samples in investigation of forensic cases or uh, criminal cases and if at all the judiciary is ordered to remove those DNA samples then under that judicial order it will remove or it will permanently destroy those DNA samples. So this is what the recent uh, biotechnology department secretary said. So this is the uh, article. So what is the DNA profiling means? So a DNA, see in this diagram, so DNA profiling is a technique used by the scientist to distinguish between the individual of same species using only the samples of their DNA. So all the human beings are only differentiated by means of uh, similar to our fingerprint the DNA samples are also uh, unique for each and every individual in a certain particular short tandem repeats of those DNA. So by taking that short tandem repeats of the DNA they can now classify each and every individual uniquely. So this is what DNA profiling means. So what is the background? If you see the background, the DNA profiling bill was first framed by Department of Biotechnology in 2015 and the latest version which is got recently updated by the Department of Biotechnology in the name of DNA Technology Use and Application Regulation Bill 2018. So what is this aim of this DNA profiling bill? If you see, the first major aim is to establish an institutional mechanism to collect and deploy the DNA sample from the individuals by means of deploying DNA technologies in those uh, institutions uh, for what is the purpose of collecting these samples is to identify the persons based on the samples in case of uh, criminal cases or investigations or forensic purposes etc. So under this DNA profiling bill they are going to establish two uh, major things one is the DNA profiling board and another one is DNA data bank. So this DNA profiling board what it, it is going to do in the future is if at all gets implemented it will define the standards and controls of the DNA profiling activities which is carried out in those institutions and it is also going to certify the labs and handle the access of the data by law enforcement agencies. So it is going to do two major things. One is to define the standards and another one is to certify the labs as well as handling the access of the data by these law enforcement agencies whichever is getting involved in the investigation of the criminal cases. So this DNA profiling board and the DNA data bank works in tandem in order to speed up the process as well as to reform the criminal justice system. So even though it is good, there are certain concerns in carrying out this DNA profiling bill. So what are those concerns? So the first one is we already know the Supreme Court upheld her right to privacy as a fundamental right. So which means we all have the privacy as a fundamental right. So by means of collecting these DNA samples from the individual, it is actually affecting the privacy of the individual. So that is what the major concern. See if you hear, you see, it can bring major benefits to the society by means of collecting samples because it speeds up the process, it reforms the criminal criminal justice system etc but it also affects the privacy of the individual and it also could or might result in the misuse of those tissue samples or genetic informations or the personal data whichever getting collected from the individuals so in this diagram you can see how a dna profile is made so the first they take the blood samples and they extracted the dna from the samples and the en they cut the enzymes so so that they get this short tandem repeat so from that they can easily identify the gene of the particular individual. So this is what this article suggests. The second article is S400 Air Defense Systems from Russia. So what this article suggests is India going ahead with the purchase of 5 S400 Air Defense Systems from Russia. So despite of the American concerns that what we have, so this is what our Defense Minister Nirmala Sitaraman told. 
what is it American concern is CATSA actually which is countering America's adversaries through sanctions act by means of implementing this CATSA the US is actually putting sanctions on three major countries like North Korea Iran as well as Russia so by means of implementing CATSA on these countries what they are telling is the other countries should also have to restrict their trade relationship with these three countries but in CATSA itself they actually they also mentioned that the waivers will be incorporated into the CATSA to protect the friends and allies so which means uh, even though the sanctions are putting on these three countries the waivers will be incorporated to the friendship countries as well as the ally countries that is what the cards are actually tells so what is the major concern here for india is we heavily dependent on russia for military hardware but if at all we are going to comply with us cards are then we are going to lose our strategic uh, position in the south asia so what this kamkaza actually tells about is it is actually a legal framework for the transfer of the communication security equipment which is encrypted from US to Indian military operations. The interoperability between the US equipment as well as the Russia's equipment is still a major concern because it is not interoperable. So that is a one concern if we are going to uh, making progress in terms of Kamkaza. How they conclude in this article is. India as a sovereign country it has its own way of dealing with the bilateral relationship with other countries like Russia Iran or North Korea rather than relying on or rather than bounding by the US laws which is made by the US parliament so the third article is coming home to jail so this deals with the repatriation of prisoners act 2003 so they also stated in this article that this uh, law which is the repatriation of prisoners act 2003 will prove to be a win win situation for india or for whatever countries which is dealing with india so what is the background of this case if you see means then two persons from gujarat and madhya pradesh uh, actually accidentally crossed the india pakistan border and they sentenced into jail for this illegal entry into pakistan so this cases came into light only after the death of a person after 9 years in the jail in pakistan Pakistan and another case came into light only after the uh, detention which is accepted by the person or which is experienced by the person after 5 years so why because the detainment which is actually experienced by these persons in those jails uh, the detention of these persons in the foreign uh, jail uh, why because it is a result of the delayed consular attention as well as the nationality verification so if we see in other perspective then the tribulations or the sufferings being suffered by a person in a foreign land is very much heavier than the person who is suffering in its in his own land so it is also could lead to the severe traumatic or health related diseases or disorders for the person who whoever, whoever is suffering in the foreign land so what this repatriation actually means is sending a person or sending a prisoner from the host country to the home country so we are also having a lot of international humanitarian commitments to deal with these kind of transfer of the prisoners from one country to another country so if you see the three major uh, humanitarian commitments the first commitment which is the international covenant on civil and political rights in that the article 124 states the right to return to one's home country it should be ensured to each and every individual who is getting detained by the any government similarly the vienna convention on consular access of 1963 we india is also a member we are also ratified that uh, vienna convention so according to that vienna's international treaty we provide the information to consulate or the consular protection as well as to the consultation upon the arrest detention on during the trial of for a prisoner in a foreign country so consular means an embassy in a uh, foreign country which is there to take and care the needs of the people of his own country so consular access we see right so what is this consular means it is an embassy in the foreign country so the consular has two major purposes one is to protect the interest of their countrymen in the foreign land and the second one is to furthering or increasing the economic relationship as well as the commercial relationship between the two countries so this is the purpose of the consular in a foreign land so um, if we see the next one it is the un model agreement on the transfer of foreign prisoners so it is also emphasize on the social rehabilitation of the foreign prisoners by means of repatriating or transferring the prisoners from the host country to the home country to serve their remaining sentences in the prison so these are all the commitments which is done at the international level but if we see at indian level so we are also having this repatriation of prisoners act 2003 
So what is this Repatriation of Prisoners Act deals with means? It deals with two things. One is to transfer the sentenced foreign national prisoners from India to their home country. The second one it deals with is the transfer of the sentenced Indian nationals from the host country to India. So these are two major things which is dealt in this Repatriation of Prisoners Act 2003. So what are the eligibility for the repatriation? or the transfer of the prisoner from the host country to the home country. So these are all the eligibilities. First, if the prisoner is willing to go from the host country to the home country, then it is an eligibility. And if suppose the case is having no pending appeals and the case is finalized, then also it is an eligibility to transfer the person. So the third one is the offence is not an offence under military law. So it is not under military law, then we can transfer the person. And also the sentence is not a death sentence. So if it is not a death sentence, we can transfer the person from the uh, host country to the home country. And the last eligibility is they have at least six months of their sentence still left to serve. So that is minimum he has to have six months of the imprisonment needs to be uh, get done. So in that case also we can transfer the person from the um, host country to the home country with the consent of both the treaty countries. So why we need this uh, repatriation of act of 2003 is we as a country have lot of inflows and outflows of the persons annually by means of blue and white color workers fishermen students stateless persons etc so we have lot of persons who are getting migrated from one country to another country all over the world every day so by means of doing this repatriation act possible only then we can ensure the safety and security of the persons who are getting migrated to the host country so it is like a cooperative administration of the justice framework so the data reason data shows that 7,000 Indian nationals are in the prisons of different countries uh, all over the world and also like 6,000 foreign national prisoners are serving in our country. So this clearly shows that why we need this repatriation right and the second one is we need not to spend unduly on housing the foreign national prisoners in our jail which means we have to spend the money for the prisoners who are getting their imprisonment in our country. So that is also a burden for the Indian economy. So it is also if we at all we transfer the person from the host country to the home country then we don't need to do these kind of unduly uh, uh, unduly spending on the foreign national prisoners the third is to save the cost of uh, providing consular services abroad by bringing back the indian prisoners if we bring back the Indian prisoners back to our country, then the cost of maintaining and the cost of providing this consular services abroad is also getting reduced. So this is also one of the advantage if this repatriation act gets established or if it gets implemented. And the fourth one is to satisfy the public expectation of bringing the nationals home. So the public is also expecting to bring back the nationals back to the home country. So to satisfy that need also, we have to uh, make use of this repatriation of act 2003. So the last one is to meet this international humanitarian commitments. So, so it is also one of the international humanitarian commitment because by means of transferring other prisoners to our, their home country as well as our prisoners to back to our country, by means of doing this we are also involving in this international humanitarian assistance so that we could ensure the safety and security of the prisoners who are getting sentenced into uh, the jails for their crimes. The fourth topic is ground zero which is the suspected foreigners of Assam. So we all know that recently the second and the final draft of Assam's National Register of Citizen which is NRC said to be published on July 30. So already the first draft getting published in uh, December 2017. So now the second and the final draft is going to get uh, published in July 30. So it raises certain concerns among the uh, people who are living in Assam. So first of all by means of publishing this NRC, the fate of millions of the peoples who are living in those area is in the balance, which means if at all the names of the people is not in those draft, then the people are treated as the suspected foreigners rather than the own indigenous people. So the fate of the millions of the people is in the hands of that NRC list. And the second one is the predicament or the uh, sufferings of those who are declared as the suspected foreigners. Even though the people of Assam, even though they are indigenous to that place but if they are treated as a suspected foreigners by means of excluding their names from this NRC list they are going to get a lot of sufferings so now uh, the burden or the efforts need to be done by the individual in order to prove that they are actually belonging to the state rather than they are not the suspected foreigners so these are all the concerns if at all this NRC final draft 
is going to get published in July 30. So if you see in this diagram the NRC which is it is unique to Assam and this NRC has the details of all the citizens in the state. So it is first prepared by the Union Home Ministry in 1951. So it is basically to prevent the immigrants or to curb the entry of the immigrants into the Assam state. So if you see the background of this NRC then it, it was first prepared in 1951 using the particulars of everyone enumerated in the census. So they are taking the census list and they are including those people into this NRC list. So this is the first step which was taken by the government in 1951. The second, uh, the recent activity by the government is that it launched the exercise to update this NRC. So the, now they are trying to update this NRC list. So there comes or there rises a lot of concerns over the security of the people who are living in the Assam district. So why actually they are intending to do this updation of this NRC is they actually stated like the problem lies in the investigation by the election commission as well as by the border police. So why they are actually this election commission and the border police is trying to update this NRC is by means of stating all these as the reasons they are trying to update the NRC. Why? Because they believe that there are a lot of Bangladeshis uh, already intruded into Assam. So to uh, exclude them from Assam and to make the indigenous people alone to stay in their own state they are now trying to update this NRC this is what the first reason they are telling why they are updating this NRC the second reason is they also see this NRC as a pre-planned exercise to exclude the non Azami people from the state particularly the Bengalis of the Barak Valley so their main intention is to exclude these uh, Bengali people of Barak Valley and to exclude the non Azami people also only to retain the Azami people in the state so this is what the second major aim of the updation of this NRC so the third one is what they are telling is actually the exercise to weed the foreigners out may devalue the indigenous people so this is like a concern what they are actually telling is this kind of updating nrc to weed the foreigners away from assam and to retain the original indigenous people there in assam may also devalue the indigenous people itself because there are a lot of tribal peoples or there are a lot of illiterate peoples in assam and they are not even aware of what rights they are having and they are not also having the proofs or the credentials whatever they should have to prove their citizenship in the Assam state but if they are not having that obviously they are going to treat those peoples as the foreigner peoples not as the indigenous people so this is also devalued the original people or the uh, indigenous people right so this is also a major concern in terms of updating this NRC so if you see Assam is the only state to have this border police or Assam police border organization why because to curb the illegal migration from the other countries into Assam so this uh, is getting implemented under the prevention of inf infiltration so, so this getting implemented under the prevention of infiltration of the Pakistanis act 1964 and in 1974 this prevention of infiltration of Pakistanis act become an independent branch which is headed by the ADGP so supreme court in 2005 also scrapped this illegal migrants act 1983 but while it was in role that is this illegal migrants act was in role the burden to prove that the individual is belonging to that state lies on the state that means the state has to prove that the individual is actually belonging to that state and the burden is not on the individual but now what the se did is it brought back the foreigners act of 1946 by means of scrapping this illegal migrants act so under this foreigners act of 1946 it again shifted the proof or uh, the burden of the proof that the individual is actually belonging to that state and not to any foreign nationals is now lies again on the individual and not on the state so here you see right i mean the individual himself have, has to prove that he is belonging to that state and he is not any suspected foreigner uh, suspected foreigner or uh, any immigrant and all so what are the concerns so they are now trying to update this NRC document or NRC draft, right, which has the name of all the citizens who are living in the state of Assam. So even though it is a good step to curb the illegal immigrants into the country or into the state, as well as to provide the rights of the individual citizens in their own homeland, even though it is a good move, but there are a lot of concerns over the issue. The first one is Assam is a flood prone area, we all know. So documents, uh, who, whichever the credentials or the proofs which are maintained by the people of Assam gets destroyed by water. So this is also a major concern you see, right? If you're going to submit that uh, credentials, 
credential or the proof to the government then only they are going to accept you as an uh, as an indigenous people or this original citizen of the state else they are going to uh, declare you as a suspected foreigner or a immigrant so this is a major concern the second one is it is going to impact many lives especially the poor people or the illiterate bengali people so the poor people or illiterate people is also not aware of what the rights actually they have in their own homeland so it is also a major concern because they are not even aware of what the rights they have so obviously they don't know how to uh, approach the government and making their names in this nrc list and all so it is also again pushing them into the suspected foreigners the third one is the expense burden or expense hurdles so each and every individual having lot of expense burdens like um, if you see they want to make your name into this nrc list they have to cross a lot of bureaucratic hurdles as well as uh, they have to prove their family tree verification process so it is the submission of the documents to prove that you are belonging to that state and uh, to cross this bureaucratic hurdles everything becomes a concern for this uh, in each and every individual of the assam so the next concern is the d voter which means the doubtful voter so there is one concept evolving which is the doubtful voter so if any citizen is lacking the credentials or the proofs that is proving that he is actually belonging to that state then he is also considered as a doubtful voter so this could raise the fear that the genuine indian citizens who are actually belonging to the assam state could get left out from this nrc list so the last and the major important concern is creation of the stateless people so if stateless people are getting uh, created in our country then obviously it led to the exploitation of those peoples in many ways or in bad ways as we also that means india has no treaty with any other country for the deportation of the individuals who are getting deported from the country to any other countries so this uh, considering all these concerns we have to take the uh, sufficient measures in order to tackle this nrc list updation so on conclusion what they are telling is on making this draft nrc list which is the final draft of the nrc list the assam government should take the sufficient measures in order to uh, ensure that the original citizens or the indigenous people of the assam state should not get left out in those list so this is what they proposed